All right, so this lesson is still about the coordinate plane, just more like applying some stuff about it. Um, so we have, for example, splitting the distance. I did see this on your final. And honestly, as long as you're able to like pick from a set of options, which one is the right one, then you should be good. Like it shouldn't be this difficult. Um, but just in case you're doing it from scratch, maybe it's like an open response question. We have, for example, um, a theme park and your friend is meeting you at a location that was two thirds the distance from the roller coaster to the Ferris wheel. Um, you may know that they meant to meet up at the hot dog park. And it is asking, where is the hot dog part? So the hot dog part is two thirds the distance from the roller coaster to the Ferris wheel. So we're going this way, going two thirds the distance this way. You could probably like eyeball it, but there are ways to know for sure where it's exactly supposed to be. So you could do that by measuring like where your first point is. So like, where is point A? on the coordinate plane. It's at zero, zero. And we're going all the way to point B, which is where? And we need to go two thirds of the way there. So you're kind of counting your left or right movement. So let's start with the X. We went from zero to six. How many spaces did we move? Six spaces. What's two thirds of six? If you don't know, you can multiply. And if you don't know how to multiply fractions, you can put it in Desmos and they can do it for you. It is four. All right, if you don't believe me, I'll show you. Um, there's no reason to avoid problems with fractions. All right, usually, and Desmos, it doesn't really matter as much, but usually I tell my students, make sure your fraction is in parentheses before you start doing stuff to it. Um, in this one, we're multiplying by six, and yeah, it does equal four. Sometimes it gives me a decimal, and if I want like it to be in fraction form, then I'll click a button that'll show up right here that is like a fraction to decimal button. Um, just so you know, then it'll give you the fully simplified fraction. But yeah, two thirds of six spaces, that's our distance really, is four. And that's where the X value will be for the hot dog stand. Um, now for the Y, track the movement on the Y, it started out as zero and is ending at six, just happens to be really similar to the X. So how many spaces did it move? Six spaces. What's two thirds of six? So then where's my hot dog stand going to be? Going to be at four four. I'm not really yet. Um, and doesn't that visually look like two thirds of the distance? So then you know you're on the right track. I think when I took your final, because I always take it to make sure that I can do it, I wouldn't make you guys do anything I don't know how to do. Um, I just plotted all my points because it gave me some options, like the hot dog stand was at this point, this point, or this point. And I plotted them all and visually I looked at, okay, that one actually looks like it's going two thirds of the way or whatever it was on your final. Okay, so that's really all I need you to be able to do. Questions on that one? All right, so then moving forward. Uh, here's another example. We want point C that is located four fifths of the distance from point A to point B. 
So figure out where A is. Where is A at? Zero, three, where is B at? And then measure like the movement. So like the X movement. We went from zero to five. So we moved how many spaces? And it gives us the fraction that it basically wants us to figure out was four fifths of five. to plug it into your calculator if you don't know. You can also do it by hand. So like what's four times five? 20 and then 20 divided by five. Okay, good. So that's gonna be the X of my point C. That's four fifths of zero to five is four. Then do the same now, but for the Y movement. We went from, for my Ys, we went from three to one. Now, how many spaces did we move? I know since we're going down, it's like negative, but it's kind of ignore the fact that it's negative. Um, that's a difference of two spaces. So then we're going four fifths of two spaces. Either put that in your calculator or know how to do it by hand. I think that one is like a decimal. All right, but we have four fifths of two. It's 1.6. And since we're working with the coordinate plane, we are going to use the decimal just because I can't really graph like two thirds really that well. Um, but yeah, so then my Y is 1.6. But also keep in mind, like we're going down 1.6. So I guess instead of making you think that this is what my final coordinate will be, this is more like what we're moving to. So you're moving for. And in this one, you're going to the right. And then you're moving down 1.6. So the actual coordinate isn't necessarily going to be 4, 1.6. We're going to go right 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and down 1.6, which is about here. That's where point C is. And you label where it's at after you move it. Okay, so the x value of that is four. What's the y value of that? So that's what we move down by. So then looking at where it's at, it's above the one, and it's actually 1.4. Does that make sense? So we had to go from here to here. We had to go down 1.6 to figure out where it is at. Does that make sense? No. So where it currently is at is at 1.4 because we went from here to move 4 and we went down 1.6. So like what's 3 minus 1.6? Went right for we went down 1.6. The y value started at 3, 3 minus 1.6 is what? It is 1.4. So that's where C is at. So you're tracking your movement. Questions on that one? I think the next one's similar, so I might be able to have you guys do that. If you try it, you didn't copy it down already. And it is you try. Okay, so this one. 
We're finding point C, that is one fourth the distance from point A to point B. Right, so you guys try that one. If, um, you might have copied it down, but now I'll try maybe like not looking at the answer you copied down. And just try to figure if you could reason it on your own. So point C is going to be a fourth of the distance going from point A to point B. Um, Honestly, you could probably like eyeball it, but we want exact answers for this question. On your final, I think you could probably just eyeball it out of the options they give you. But um, you have to take note of where each point is. So where is A? And where is B? And then you need to count the movement on the X and on the Y. So like for the X movement. And you always wanna go from where you started to where you ended. So like I went from two to four. How much did I move? I moved two spaces and we need to go a fourth of that to find point C. So what's a fourth of two? 0 0.5 or one half, the same difference. Um, so yeah. A fourth of two is 0.5. So when I'm doing my moving, I'm going to move from A, 0.5 on the X. But now I need my Y. All right, so my Y movement, we went from four to negative two. How many spaces did we go? So ignore the fact that it's negative. How many spaces that would be? Okay, good. And then what's one fourth of six? And I do think you need a calculator for. So one fourth of six. Is one point five. Now, keep in mind, this isn't going to be like my ordered pair. It's not going to be at 0.5 on the 1.5. But this is telling me how much I'm moving. Uh, so this one, notice going from A to B, we have to go right. So we're going to move right 0.5. And then we're going to move down 1.5. And you're going to do that from where A is. So A is here. We're going to the right 0.5 and down one and a half, which is here. That is where point C is. Doesn't it look like it goes in a straight line, first of all? Yes. And then measure where C is at. So it looks like C is at what X value? Two point five. And what Y value? Good. We call that partitioning, by the way, in case you see that on your time. So questions on that? Okay. Um, yeah, let's do a little bit more. So again, this is more like a recap because you probably already watched the video. So, or hopefully you did. So I'm just gonna kind of tell you what you should pay attention to and highlight. So ratios can be represented as fractions, um, such as one over four, but they can also be represented using a colon symbol, like the numbers um, one, two, four, then that's how we read it. So the ratio one to four is read one to four. If you're asked to find a distance that is a ratio of one to four between two points, Kind of pay attention to how many parts you have. So you're going to have to convert that into a fraction. So the equivalent fraction to one to four, it is not, because it's not actually going to be like one fourth. All right, ratios we use a lot with recipes. For example, like this could be one part sugar for every four parts flour. I don't know. 
how many parts total do I have? That's one part of sugar. What about combined with the parts of flour? So now that's parts of flour, put them together. How many parts do I have? So you want to pay attention to how many parts you have. And then if it's one to four that it wants you to make that ratio, then you use that numerator. So I'm definitely make a note of that star, highlight it. And it does say it here, just like in longer sentences, it's five equal pieces and then finding one of those. All right, so if we're splitting something in a ratio of two to three, because that's like the next thing, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. All right, if we're splitting something into a ratio of two to three, how many parts do I have? Just think about it, don't say it out loud. All right, how many parts do I have total? You can say it now. Five. So we have five parts. The equivalent fraction would be two out of five. So it's just like how we did in the examples before that. The only added thing now is you have to convert the ratio to the correct fraction. If you did two thirds, then that would be wrong. All right, so now that you know what fraction it should be, you should be able to continue from there. All right, questions on that? I think from there is where the video is. So I think I'm gonna to switch to the annotated notes. So if you haven't done that already, try that right now. All right, so we established that the ratio two to three, the equivalent fraction would be two fifths because there's five parts total. Um, so you need to pay attention to what your starting point and your ending point are at. So X is at two, negative two. Yeah, I'm gonna put the right now. That's a good one. Okay, so X is at two, negative two. Yeah, I'm just not letting you write. Um, but yeah, X is at two, negative two. B is at six, six and we're basically going two-fifths of the way there. So then how, how many spaces you're moving? Going from negative two to positive six, you moved eight spaces. And then multiply that by your fraction. That's what we did over here. All right, 16 over five is equivalent to 3.2. Now that's not gonna be my X of my new coordinate necessarily. That's just how much we're moving. And you always have to move in the same direction that like your end point is. So in this one, and this one we're moving from X to Z, we're going up 3.2. So up one, two, three, and like 0.2 is where we move there. Oh wait, no, that's on the end. So we're moving on the X in the same direction as the Z, one, two, three, and point two would probably be right here. If you look at your Y value where it ended up being, that X value is about where? It's past the one a little bit. And if I move from here, 3.2, then it's at one point. Where is my new Y value at? Just the X. If we went from where X is at negative two and we moved to the right 3.2, what's negative two plus 3.2? Two? Two. Not 5.2, 1.2, right? And that lines up, it's a little bit past the one. And it's 0.2, because we went plus 3.2. Does that make sense? 
All right, so then measuring your change in the Y going from two to six, that's four spaces. You want to multiply that by your fraction. So four times two fifths, that's what we did over here. That's moving 1.6 away. And this time you have to move for the Z, 1.6. So then I could do it up here. Uh, one about 0.6 and they meet up right here. So look at where it ended up. It's between the three and the four. Since I moved up 1.6, that means it's at 3.6 for the line. And that's like my final answer. This just tells me how much to move. Up. Questions on that? Yeah. All right, Pythagorean theorem, hopefully that's a bit of review and kind of like a safe space. If not, um, here's the part to highlight. So the formula for it is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and it only works for right triangles. All right, and c would have to be the hypotenuse, or in other words, the longer side. Right, and A and B could be the other two sides. It doesn't really matter. C has to be the hypotenuse. And it's always the one that faces the right angle. All right. So then if they tell you all the parts, great. You could draw a triangle. Know that C always has to be your hypotenuse. So that's why I labeled it across from the right angle. And then to solve it, you plug it into that formula. All right, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This, I don't know if you're familiar with three, four, five triangles, but it is like something else that there's like multiples of something that if the A is this and B is this and C is always that, a three, four, five triangle is like a really common right triangle. And I did see it on your card. But you don't really have to have that memorized. You can just memorize the formula and how to use it. Questions on that? All right. So then, you know, C has to be the long side. This one, we were solving for C. So that's why. Uh, so then when you plug it in, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals C squared with 3 squared. 9, you guys all know how to use your calculator to figure that exponent. in. That's okay. All right, if not, so let me show you real quick. Um, if you pull up this keyboard, so like 3 squared was the one we just did, it's this button. And then the next one, I think, is 4 squared. Say that you want it to be a different exponent other than two. Press this button and then type in your exponent. That's it. All right, so then that's what we get for. All right, that's what we get for this part, nine plus 16, which is 25. C is still not alone though. So what's the opposite of squaring something? No, it is not. Just try to So opposite of squaring. Like if we did what we did do three squared. How could I go back to the three sometimes? I can square root it. That's what we did here. We square rooted the C squared. And whatever you do on one side of the equal sign, you have to do to the other side. You do it to the right side so that you get the C alone. All right, undo a C then. Then whatever you do one side, you have to do to the other. So the square root of 25 is five, and that's how you can solve it. 
If it's not a perfect square, you could leave it as the square root of whatever, but that one is. Four or five ten. There. All right, so then I'm going down. More examples. This time, if other parts missing, so C has to be the hypotenuse, so the longest side, that means we're missing one of these guys. All right, make sure you plug it into the right spot. So, yeah, 10 squared is 100, 20 squared is 400. This time, we're trying to isolate the B. So then undo what's being done and always start with what's farther from the B. So what's farther, the 100 or the 2? Like physically farther. The 100, right? The 2 is on the B. The 100 is not. So always start with what's farther. Um, and then undo what's being done. So how can I cancel out a 100? Subtract it, whatever you do on one side. Get to the other side. And then you get B squared. It's not fully alone yet. We want this to be B. And that's where you cancel out the square by square rooting again. You know, whatever you do on one side, go to the other side. Um, and yeah, so that cancels out this square, B is alone. And then this is not a perfect square if I put it in the calculator. Oh, hold on. If I put it in the calculator, it gives me a long decimal. You guys should be able to simplify the radical, so simplify it. Um, and that's why I wrote my final answer as 10 radical 3, which if you look, it gives me the same exact decimal. All right, so I don't think your answer will be represented as a non-simplified radical. So that's why you need to learn both. Um, but it's pretty easy, at least I think so. Um, if it's the square root of 300 and we need to simplify that radical, you could do that by making a factor tree. So like, what are two numbers that multiply to 300? Two numbers that multiply to 300. 30. 30 and 10. And you could have picked others, but regardless, we're gonna think get the same prime number. Um, 30 breaks into what? Are these both prime? So six is not prime, it can be broken down into what? And then now three and two are prime, so we're done there. Five is prime, 10 is not. So what does 10 bring into? Okay, good. Only look at the prime numbers, and prime means that you can't break it down anymore except for like one in itself. So I'll even cross out the non-prime numbers so that way you're not looking at the wrong spot. Um, so just looking at these, I want you to pretend that that square root symbol, also called a radical symbol, is like a little jail cell. All right, to escape the jail, you need a partner. So do I have any pairs of the same number? What are they? So a pair of twos, they get to escape, and I just write it once for each pair, so they'll go outside. Do I have any other pairs? Pair of fives. So if there's multiple pairs, you're going to multiply them. No more pairs. I have a three that's left. It didn't have a partner, so it doesn't get to escape. So it's inside. And then simplifying and multiplying you need to do. What's five times two? And that's why this is equivalent to that. Good, makes sense. Any questions? I'm sure we'll see more of those. So just know how to simplify your radicals. So you can check if you did it right by plugging both in and seeing if they give you the same decimal. All right, I see some people right. So, um, yeah. Okay. 
Okay. So back to this. Um, another example. So in this one, they have it where they have a non-perfect square as one of the side lengths. You still plug it into the formula the same way. So you need to know where you're plugging everything into. Um, the hypotenuse is always the what? The longest side. And it's the one that faces your right angle. So the two has to go in the C spot because that's my hypotenuse. That's why I plugged in the two here. This doesn't really matter. Like you can call this A, you can call it B. Just plug it into one of them. And this one I plugged it into B. Now you could put this in the calculator, but also I know that this confuses students. I told you that squaring and square rooting are opposites of each other, right? I remember that. So they really just cancel each other out. Like if I did nine squared and then I took the square root of it, I would just get nine because what's nine squared? No, 81 and then the square root of 81 is. So that's why in this one, it goes away when you do the A squared plus B squared plus C squared. All right, my C squared, two squared is four. And then we're still isolating the variable. So undo is being done. Cancel out the three by subtracting it, whatever you on one side, the other side, four minus three is one. And then you cancel out the square by square rooting. What's the square root of one? So that's why this is my five Good. Moving right along, we have a U try. So this one is, I think, really similar to something on your final. So let's actually go through it. Um, so the center of the Great Pyramid of Giza contains different chambers used by the ancient Egyptians using the dimensions of other parts of the pyramid. You could determine how far you would have to walk from the outside to the center of the pyramid. So they're like, I guess, walking up it. The, or maybe into it, something like that. Yeah. If it's the base, then they're walking into it. The height of the pyramid from the very top to the center of the bottom at a 90 degree angle is 262 meters. So going from the top to like the center of the base. It's 262. The slant height or distance of the slanted side of the pyramid, which is the hypotenuse, is 440. So that's why B, or you could call it A still if you want, is the part that you're missing. All right, you plug it into your formula. These happen to be bigger numbers, but you have access to a calculator, so no excuses there and isolate the B. So subtract on each side. Opposite of squaring is, and then we're taking the square root of this. And since we're finding the distance of something, is it okay for our answer to be a decimal? Yes, because I don't think this is a perfect square. I'm not gonna have you make a factor tree to simplify that really long number. All right, but that was one, two, three, four, nine, five, six. Okay. And then you just round it appropriately. So if it tells you, then round to whatever it tells you. But if it doesn't, I think like two spaces is good enough. So you guys know your rounding rules. I always have to go over it with my seven. So is this going to be 353.49 or is it going to be 353.50? 
no it's not because the number wasn't okay good so if we're rounding to two spaces wherever you're rounding to and that would also be called the hundred spot by the way if you want to like underline it and then look immediately to the right of it if that number is zero through four then the number you underline stays the same if it's five and above you give it a shove you round up wherever you underline all right since the number to the right of the nine is one, you're gonna keep it as a nine, so then it's this. And then of course, it just depends whatever they have you around to. Just underline it and look to the right. Questions on that? Okay, so let's see. All right, so reviewing perimeter, of all shapes. So perimeter of, how do you find the perimeter of any shape? Out of all the sides. So if you just remember that rule, great. They also give you some for like, if it's a square, if it's a rectangle, really for perimeter, just add all the sides. But yeah, like what do we know about squares? All their sides are the same. So you could just do four times one of the side lengths. What do we know about rectangles? Their opposite sides are the same. So you could do two times the length, times two times the width, and add it together if you really need to. No, just add them all together. Okay. So for example, we have a square side length is 3x minus 1 feet, and the perimeter is 80 feet. So again, you could just write 3x minus 1 on all the sides and then add all of those together. Or since you know that they have all the sides the same, you could use this formula for it. So it gives us two pieces of information. It tells us what the perimeter is. So you plug in your perimeter, it tells you it's 80. And then it tells you what a side length is. So then you can plug it in for the side length. Anytime you plug stuff in, what should you use? Parentheses. Because if you didn't, if you just did four times three X and then a minus one, you would forget to apply the four to the negative one, okay? What happens when you see a number outside parentheses like this? You multiply by both the inside numbers. So that's why it's important you use parentheses. Four times three X is? Four times negative one is? Positive or negative? Negative four, because four times the negative. So positive times the negative is always a negative. And then isolate the X, start with what's farther, what's physically farther, the 12 or the four. The four, how do you make the four zero? Which is, so we'll add four, whatever you do on one side. 80 plus four is 84. Over here, it's just 12x now, because that goes away. Um, what's opposite of multiplying by 12? Whatever you do on one side, and x ends up being 84 divided by 12. And Is it really true? Yes. Questions on that? Probably review because you watched the video, but just in case, this is the time now to ask questions. Tomorrow you will have a quiz, so you have daily quizzes. It'll be on 6.04. So that and your practice, like if you have questions on it, you should be asked. All right, but um, example two, we have the perimeter of regular polygon. What does, when it says regular polygon, what does that mean? Okay, so the polygon part is that there's five sides. 
When it says regular, what does it mean about those sides? Okay, it is a closed shape. Anyone else? So regular polygon, regular hexagon, whatever shape it is, means that all the sides are the same. And actually, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's five sides. Five sides would be pentagon. Um, we don't know how many sides this is because it just says polygon, but we do know that all the sides are the same. So how many sides does it have is what we're trying to figure out. So if the perimeter is 48, perimeter measures what? Everything on the outside. If the perimeter is 48 and one side, which they would all be the same, measure six yards. Then we're trying to figure out how many sides there are. So you set it up. If you want to problem solve it. Any unknowns you label with a variable. So for example, we could use X to talk about the number of sides, which we don't know. So that times the number of sides, six times the number of sides would give me the perimeter, right? So in that case, do the opposite of what's being done to the X. What's opposite of multiplying by six? Whatever you do on one side. And then 48 divided by six is eight. So we have eight sides total. Get there. All right, more examples. So more applications. You have length of a rectangle is 2x plus 5 inches. Width is x minus 1 inches. I usually always draw a picture to help me out. If the perimeter is 80 inches, what are the dimensions of the rectangle? So again, you could write this multiple times and put them all in an expression next to each other. Or you could use the one that they gave you. It is in your packet. You can use your notes on the quizzes. So that way you only have to write the expression once. All right, so two times the width. It says the width was x minus one. Anytime you plug stuff in, you should use parentheses. Length is two x plus five. Again, plug them in with the parentheses. And any numbers outside with no like symbol in between, we should do what with? Multiply them. So know how to distribute. Two times x is two x. Two times negative one is negative two. Two times two x is four. Two times five is four. And then usually after distributing, you have to combine like terms. You guys know how to tell if it's a like term. So like what would be a like term with the 2x? Yeah. And that's because they both have an x to the first power. So 2x plus 4x is 6x. And then is there a like term with this negative 2? The 10. Why? Because they're both single numbers. So you can always combine the single numbers. Negative two plus 10 is negative eight. Oh no, just kidding, positive eight. Right here. And now it just becomes a two-step equation. Isolate the X, start with what's farther. That would be the eight. How do I cancel out the eight? Now whatever you do on one side. So 80 minus 8 is 72. This over here cancels. We have 6x equals 72. I'm going to put down now. Opposite of multiplying by 6 is 
and then x and the three as well. So again, that's just what x equals. All right, x is here and here. It's not my length and my width respectively. I would have to plug it in to my length and my width respectively to figure out the dimensions of the rectangle. So like if this is my width, what's 12 minus one? So that's why my width is 11. And then over here, my length was 2x plus five. We know x is now 12. Two times 12 is four. And then plus five is two dollars. All right, so make sure you also answer the questions as that piece. Sometimes it just wants to know what X is. Sometimes it wants to know like the length only. I don't know, but this one wanted both the length and the width. Good? All right. All right, so this one's a fun one. Let me see if we have, we can finish this one. All right, so, the shaded rectangle is representing a pool with a width of 15 feet and a length of 30. The larger rectangle is the pool deck and it has a distance of five feet from every side of the pool. Having a width of 25 feet and a length of 40 feet. So that's nice, they did that wrong. You're building a fence around the pool deck. So around the bigger rectangle. You want to know how much fencing you need. So if I'm only going around a shape, what type of measurement is that? Perimeter. Perimeter. Right? Area would be everything inside, right? And really, we're only talking about perimeter today, so it makes sense that it would be perimeter. And it's a rectangle. So you could use the two times the length, the length. Two times the width, so two times the length. And it did tell you the dimensions of the pool deck. So make sure you use those dimensions. Plug it in, easy peasy. That one you could put entirely in your calculator. I'm getting the right answer. All right, so let's see how much more. Hold on. Okay, so we'll stop there. Again, this was more of a recap versus like, it shouldn't have been the time that it's the first time. Um, tomorrow, Geo 2, you guys will start with like the end of this recap. You should have had enough time to complete your practice. Um, I will answer any questions you have on it before you take your quiz tomorrow. So you should be back on schedule. Usually you start each class period with the quiz, but we're a bit behind. So we should be able to do that tomorrow after we review the practice. Um, do one while they take the quiz? Go recap your stuff. All right, questions, comments, concerns? Okay. No